Om Anadya Vidya Nirvatya Karano Padhi Ruchyate Upadi Tritayadanyam Atmanam Avadharayet Anadi Beginningless Avidya Nescience Anirvatya Indescribable Karanopadihi Causal Body Uchate is said Upadi Limiting Adjunct Tritayadanyam Other than the three bodies Atmanang Atman the self, avadharayet, you should understand. Avidya, which is indescribable and beginningless, is the causal body. Know for certain that the Atman is other than these three upadis, conditioning bodies. Namaste. So this verse describes the causal body. The previous verse describes the subtle body, and the one before that describes the gross body. Now, the gross body and the subtle body are fairly well understood by most students of yoga, and meditation, esoteric literature, and so on. But the causal body is not. And the reason for this is really very simple. The gross body is associated with jagrat consciousness. That means consciousness of the body, the senses, and their objects. Svapna consciousness is what implements the subtle body, the mind, the intelligence, memory, ego, reason, logic, and so forth. So, then what is the causal body? If will and intelligence and so on are the subtle body, what is the causal body? Well, it's the desire or the intention that is behind all the other manifestations. And it is implemented by sushupti consciousness. And people are not well aware of sushupti. Why is that? Because when you enter sushupti at night, after being awake and dreaming, it seems like there's nothing there. And we talked the other day in the Insights video about meditation on the void. And that's what sushupti is. It's the void. There are no objects to be conscious of. So it's very difficult to tell whether you're conscious or not. And the Buddha calls this neither perception nor non-perception. It's kind of tricky to wrap your mind around. But if you do a lot of meditation, this will become obvious. See, this is the problem. Most people read books or watch videos but they don't actually do the practices. Now, if you sit down and you actually do the practice, then you come to know these things through experience. It's not theory anymore. But the trend in Kali Yuga is to move away from the practice and into the theory and then pretend to be realized. And this is going on in Neo-Advaita. It's going on in what passes for Buddhism today, and so on. So we don't accept this. <laughs> we insist that the practice has to come first. In fact, in my experience, the practice is what opens up the understanding of the theory. In fact, all of my investigation into Vedas and Buddha's teaching and so on has been to try to understand my experience. This is the sign of a healthy practice. 
If you're doing the practice, you will have spiritual experiences that are beyond your ability to understand. And then you have to go hit the books <laughs> and study and try to get the theory behind it so you can understand how it works, what's going on. In my case, I think uh, three or four videos back, I told the experience I had in 1984 where Shakti came into the room, gave me Shakti pot, and boom, suddenly I could see Brahman in the world and the world in Brahman simultaneously. Well, this was an amazing experience and it opened up a whole new level of perception. But at the time, I didn't have the background. I didn't know the theory, especially of Brahman, because I had come up through the Vaishnava path, which is, you know, duality, devotion, and like that. And so I was really unprepared for this experience. And uh, it took me a good long time to understand it and own it. But as soon as I did, then, oh, it became uh, very easy, very simple, natural to recreate it anytime. So the question is then, what is Sushupti good for? Well, if you ask the Buddha, he says it's a refuge. If you understand that there's a, a Shunyata Sutta, the, uh, the lecture or the sermon about emptiness, he focuses on what is not there. Like, what is not there when you go out of the town and you go into the forest and you're just sitting quietly in a peaceful place? The hustle bustle of the village, the traffic, people running around, kids screaming and so on is empty. It's gone. So this is the thing you notice when you go to the forest is that the noise of the village is gone. The village is empty. It's not there. So this is a recurring theme in the Buddha's teaching, that it's more important to notice what's not there. And that is often the defining feature of a spiritual experience. So then he takes it a step further. He says, what if you enter the first jhana? The first jhana is directed thought and ideation according to a matrix, the matrix being the Buddha's teaching. So if you enter that, then what you experience is that the forest is not there because you're concentrating, you're focusing your mind on a specific chain of thoughts. And that doesn't include your surroundings. So that is also now empty. And then he goes step by step uh, until he reaches the complete emptiness, shunyata. He calls it first nothingness or space, and then unlimited consciousness filling that space, then nothingness, shunyata, emptiness, and finally neither perception nor non-perception. Because if there's nothing to perceive, it's hard to know whether you are actually perceptive or not. But then there's one more step, and that's the most interesting one of all. When you go from neither perception nor non-perception to themeless concentration, there's no script, there's no goal, there's no object, there's no subject. You're in non-dual consciousness of what? Well, what else is there except yourself? So this is why people think that Sushupti is very difficult. It's not difficult. It's just that we don't have the right muscles, you know? We haven't developed 
the, the means to shift from one state of consciousness to another until we reach that highly subtle, highly empty state. But when we do, oh, then it's like obvious what all the teachings are all about. So, you see, now this raises a suspicion. When I read this verse, most scholars today think that Atma Bodha, although it's attributed to Shankaracharya, was not written by Shankaracharya. And there are a lot of clues to that. The meter is not typically the ones that Shankara uses. Uh, the language is not as sophisticated as he normally employs. And here's another clue. In this verse, he says that avidya, or ignorance, is indescribable and beginningless. Well, avidya is ignorance because it means no knowledge. It's the absence of knowledge. Just like the monk meditating in the forest perceives the absence of the village. One who is ignorant perceives the absence of knowledge and its result, which is suffering. And the symptom that is given for one who attains knowledge is that his suffering stops immediately. There's no delay, no lag. Huh? And when I experienced that back in 1984, it was like bliss. And Brahman is often called bliss in the Upanishads. Bliss, light, the all, the creator. There's so many epithets used to describe Brahman. But you see, the, the method in the Upanishads is to superimpose a, an image on Brahman. That Brahman is the self. Brahman is you. Brahman is the creation. Brahman is light. Brahman is the sun. There are so many metaphors. And then to negate that superimposition. And when the superimposition is gone, we notice the emptiness. And that emptiness is what then becomes filled by the self. And in that way, we can know the self. People today aren't used to this kind of thinking. Uh, because maybe never, maybe people never were. <laughs> it seems counterintuitive that why should we be paying attention to what is not there? But this leads to some very deep insights and experiences. And I'm going to talk about them in the next insights video because it's too much to talk about in this short video. And I want to just prepare the ground for it. So the next time we'll go into this, which is the secret, the deep, deep secret of why Brahman creates Maya. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.